Welcome back to another episode of 5 a.m. Theology. Chris, this week we read through the book of Esther, and I'm always amazed at how obvious and evident God's sovereign providence is over everything in this book and is clearly portrayed in this book, even though he's never mentioned. As you and I always point out when we teach this book, the events are like a domino effect. If this didn't happen, then this wouldn't happen, then this wouldn't happen, et cetera. And we list the things, and it's usually pretty mind-blowing. It always is to us. And God's providence works the same in our own lives. If we look back in the rearview mirror, we can see if this didn't happen, if this didn't happen, if this didn't happen. But usually it's only when we can look back in the rearview mirror that we can see that domino effect of God's providence. Exactly. Esther is one of my favorite books of the Bible for that very reason. Its overarching theme is God's providence, something that can and should give a Christian great comfort. But Rose, this week, one particular verse stuck out to me, and that's Esther 8, verse 17. Now, most of us are probably familiar with the book of Esther, but in case you're not, we're going to give you a quick view of what happens in the book in a nutshell before we get to that verse that I'm talking about. Esther was a Jewish virgin who grew up in Persia after Judah's exile there. Esther and her cousin Mordecai, who raised her, were some of the Jews who didn't return to Jerusalem to build, even though they were allowed to under King Cyrus. Through a series of events, Esther gets chosen to be queen of Persia. She's the queen of King Xerxes in 486 BC. At some point, the king placed a man named Haman in a high position, even giving him the ability to make laws, which were called edicts. Through one of these edicts, this wicked man, Haman, set a date for the non-Jewish people of the land to utterly destroy every Jewish man, woman, and child on one specific day in the future. But through another series of events, the tables were turned and the wicked Haman was killed. But the edict of the Jews couldn't be revoked because that was the law. You couldn't revoke an edict. However, new edicts could be made. And the king allowed Queen Esther to institute a new one, which gave the Jews the right to defend themselves against their enemies when that day of destruction came. God had providentially put Esther on the throne as queen to save the Jewish people in Persia from total annihilation. And that brings us to verse 17. When the Jews found out about Esther's edict, Esther 8 verse 17 tells us, and in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. Now, these Persians who were not Jewish weren't actually fearful of the Jews. They feared the God of the Jews. Battles at that time were always thought to be ultimately between the gods of the people group that they were fighting. So in this case, it's no wonder they were fearful. God's people were celebrating despite the fact that they had an upcoming battle and their confidence was palpable. Yeah, that is definitely confidence. Chris, there's a few things that come to mind as I read this verse. Like you said, the Jews still had a battle on the horizon, but instead of wringing their hands and fretting about it, they were glad, they had joy, and they set aside a day to party and feast. And the Persians feared God, and some of them became Jews. They wanted to get on the winning side. Yeah. After having a few conversations this week about the political turmoil in the world, some with unbelievers who are fearful of what's coming, I realized that we have a lot of opportunity right now to use the bad things that might be headed our way in the future to spread the gospel. I always try to take any bad situation and say, but God is sovereign. And what a great lead in, especially in the political climate right now. Yeah. And I've had a few opportunities this week and totally blew it. I mean, in our own nation, the United States, we're getting ready to have elections in less than two months. How often does somebody bring that up? And we're doom and gloom. We groan that it might be the last chance for conservatives to have any voice at all in this country simply because of the number of immigrants that will continue to flood our nation. And that fact and others may be good for trying to persuade someone on how or why they should vote, but we can't let that conversation stop at doom and gloom because a Christian is never without hope. 
And because there's a much more important subject to get to, and that's salvation. And like I said, I blew it a couple of times this week. First Peter 3.15 says to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asked you for a reason for the hope that's in you. But Rose, I blew it. Chris, we've all been in a situation where we found ourselves leaving hope out of our conversation and never getting to the gospel. We might not be wringing our hands, but we're not necessarily acting like people of gladness and joy when the subject comes up. I admit, I grumble about what's going on in this country. I don't like what I see. I don't like the unfairness. I don't like the evil. But what we should be doing is taking the opportunity to be glad and explain that we have hope based on two things. First and foremost, and I admit, I usually lead with this. God is in control. God is sovereign. Doesn't matter what anybody does. Doesn't matter how much cheating. What God has purposed is going to come to fruition. And that's what the whole book of Esther is all about. And second, because we have salvation through Christ and someday we're going to get a new home where there's no sin and no sorrow, talk about something to be hopeful about. Chris, you and I always say, we can't wait to see what we're like when the sin is taken away. I know. I can't wait to live without my own sin. Exactly. The sin of others. Yeah. I just want to see what am I like when I don't have sin constantly crouching at my door? Yes. But either way, it's an opportunity for us to say that we expect things to get worse at some point in history because that's what scripture tells us. However, there's always the light at the end of the tunnel. I think we said in a recent episode of 5 a.m. Theology, darkness never has the last word. No, it does not. But it is going to get worse. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 6 to 8, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these things are but the beginning of the birth pains. God is giving us tastes of future judgment that's coming. And some of that judgment is going to come directly through God's hand, like natural disasters. And some is going to come via the everyday decisions of our politicians and world leaders. There's a lot of fear in the world right now, but it's not the time for Christians to be surprised or fearful. And we can use this. Absolutely. The subject of God's providence and his judgment can naturally lead into talking about the gospel. After all, the good news of the gospel is only good news if there's bad news that we need rescuing from. The proverbial hellfire and brimstone preaching has gotten a bad rap because it's often just a motivational tool to get people to go to an altar call. And it should get a bad rap if it's just being used as a guilt motivator. If it's just being used to motivate you because you want to get out of hell free card. But as Pastor John MacArthur said, People can be saved with a message on the love of God or one based on the fear of God. You just can't leave them in the place of darkness and bad news. No. Many pagans in Persia feared God and declared themselves Jews. They became Jewish proselytes. The men were probably circumcised. I mean, that's how serious and how scared they were. Did they all have true faith in God or were they pretending because they were scared? We don't know. It's not our business to know. But one thing we do know is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen to that. And that's a good place to end this morning. Have a blessed morning, everyone.